Hey everyone, you remember me, I'm Lauren Yost, the host with the most. We're gonna be getting into chapter five, which is about the eukaryotes. We've talked now about uh, bacteria and archaea, which are prokaryotes. Remember what that means, prokaryote means before a true nucleus existed. So now we're talking about the guys that, that have actual membrane bound organelles. We are also gonna talk a little bit about where those came from. So um, that's the concepts that we're gonna be getting into for this chapter. Um, and remember, viruses are their own little thing, and that's why they're going to get their own chapter in chapter six. I forget to click on this every time. All right, so breaking it down, what we're learning about in this chapter, summarizing the evidence for endosymbiotic theory. Endosymbiotic theory essentially brings up that idea of some of our organelles that provide functions for us, like mitochondria or chloroplasts, came from like bacteria that a pre-eukaryotic originator cell um, took inside of it and then they came to uh, live together and depend on one another. So um, now we live forever with what has now become mitochondria, what was originally bacteria. And they, they gave, give us energy and we give them shelter. So that was the idea of how that came about. And now they're not individual cells. Now they're just part of our cells. And we'll give you the evidence for that. We're going to talk about um, eukaryotes versus, you know, prokaryotes, as well as the differences between like each of the groups in those, sorry, in those um, classifications. We're going to talk about the unique lifestyles of each type of eukaryotic organism. Yeah, there's quite a few of them. You know, when we talk about the um, domains, we're talking about our bacteria, archaea, eukarya. So those are the main domains. So now we're going to talk about the kingdoms that fall under um, eukarya, so animals and plants and fungi and protozoa and algae that f fall into protista and that sort of stuff. So that's what we're getting into this time. So it's the cool stuff. I feel like it's the cool stuff. So, um, yeah, because these are, are more, much more complicated organisms now, right? And we can get up into the multicellular organisms and that part's pretty cool. Um, the, so the lifestyles of each of the eukaryotic, not all of them, but you know, the, the main groups. And then um, the cell, the steps involved in cell division by mitosis. And that's how eukaryotic cells, the cells themselves are gonna divide. Remember that's part of what defines a living thing with cell theory, everything has, that is alive has to be made of cells. And those cells have to be able to divide and uh, basically multiply on their own. Like each of, each of those cells have to be able to do that. And that this is how eukaryotic cells will accomplish that, okay? So talking about the history of eukaryotes, we're really talking about like where eukaryotes came from, like in the timeline of life as a whole on earth, whatever it is that you believe as far as how life got onto earth is not what we're talking about. We're talking about now life has been introduced. Where did along the line after that, did eukaryotes start to exist? So we're saying that they appeared about um, two to, to three billion years ago. Let me see if I can get my little pen guy to work. So two to three billion years ago, um, bacteria and eukaryotes seem to have evolved from a common ancestor um, that was uh, neither prokaryotic or eukaryotic. And then, um, you know, we're talking about development of organelles is what really separated eukaryotes from the other groups. So if we look at the tree over here on the right, we can see down here that um, that is the basically telling us that the there was one progenitor, like one weird cell that essentially isn't any of these. And that was like the big daddy of all of them. And it changed and led to bacteria and whatever was going to be going down the other side. So we have bacteria on the left and then we have over here on, sorry, over here on this side, um, that would be the progenitor that broke off that eventually archaea would break off one way. And then with the introduction of organelles, the eukarya would be going on on that other side over there. So that would be over here. So that's the idea with what they're saying is going on with the um, branching. Now, there's, we're also saying that organelles, some of them at least, were trapped primitive cells inside of primitive eukaryotic cells. That's the endosymbiotic theory. So hopefully we can get into that a little bit more. It looks like we will. So essentially what we have going on here at the top, we have, let's see, so, 
So at the top, I lost my button. At the top up here, um, we have just a cell with a flexible membrane. And then over here on the other side, we have a, a, a smaller cell, a prokaryotic probably, okay? Based on the genetic information involved, that seems to be the case, it's a prokaryotic cell. Then, um, so it eats it up, literally, like um, engulfs it, takes it up inside of itself, but it doesn't, it doesn't need to digest it. It's getting energy from it. So it lets it stay. So it gets to stay and it can divide and multiply to make even more of itself within the cell based on the needs of now their symbiotic relationship, how they're depending on one another, right? And so now additionally, that cell can um, use more of its membrane for more purposes and get the endoplasmic reticulum and stuff. So now we're really using that energy from those little visitor cells to do more with the cell and create more membranes and do more and compartmentalize and all of this and become way more complicated as a result of introducing these little cells. And these little cells, we believe what happened is these little cells became mitochondria. Mitochondria provide our cells with energy. And we'll get into the evidence of why we think that is here in a moment, but then you can look over here. They're saying a similar concept happened with photosynthetic bacteria and the cell was able to learn how to use that. And the photosynthetic bacteria turned into algae and higher plants for the eukaryotes. So they can utilize um, that, what is now chloroplast maybe used to have been photosynthetic bacteria that that cell was able to create a symbiotic relationship with. Okay, so that's the idea of the that endosymbiotic theory. This is just a simpler picture of what is going on with what I was just telling you. Um, we not only had development, so we had an ancestral prokaryote, so didn't have any membranes at all. It started um, developing in folding a plasma membrane, probably um, that they realized that that was allowing them to compartmentalize and that was useful to the cell for whatever reason. And somewhere along the line, we had endosymbiosis where we were introducing um, the aerobic bacterium, which are mitochondria eventually, and then the cyanobacteria, which would be uh, photosynthetic bacteria. And then that became chloroplasts and mitochondria for our ancestor eukaryote cells, eventually down the line, okay? So what evidence do we have of this having happened at all? The nucleus and um, the existence of all these different organelles and all of that are suggesting to us that, you know, obviously we're having introduction of new membranes, but how can we give actual real evidence that this is coming from, you know, bacteria or something like that? So down here we have what they're talking about, different components of whatever in the cell that was being introduced. So now we have membranes, some of our organelles inside of our cells, so that any of the eukaryotic cells, some of them have double membranes. Why is that interesting? Because bacteria, gram negative specifically, has double membrane. Uh, bacteria have an inner membrane. They have that thin peptidoglycan cell wall, remember? And then they have an outer membrane on the outside of that. That's two membranes. So that's, we're talking a double membrane, not a lipid bilayer, but an actual double membrane. And we, you know, you only see that really in bacteria. So that's a neat thing, right? Interesting already. Um, some uh, of our um, not our cells. What I'm trying to say the organelles. There it is. <laughs> the word wouldn't come to me. Some of those organelles are susceptible to antibiotics that normally would. I don't want to say attack, but you know, we'll just do it for now until we get into um, unit three, where we're going to talk about this more, but we'll just say attack parts of really only prokaryotic cells. It doesn't affect, it shouldn't affect a eukaryotic cell at all, but the, your, uh, you know, mitochondria or your chloroplasts might be affected by like antibiotics. And so that's kind of an interesting fact to know. Um, next we have division. Whenever our cells divide in a eukaryotic cell, um, by mitosis, um, the mitochondria in our cells do not do that. They divide on their own with a process that is very similar to binary fission. They don't divide with the rest of the cell. So that's very interesting as well. So they divide like bacteria. DNA, they have uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA. 
separate actual genome within themselves. And it's circular, wouldn't you know? Remember, prokaryotes, and, um, prokaryotes have the circular genome, whereas eukaryotes like us, we have a linear, like you, when you see the Xs, right? That's what we're used to seeing for our, our genomes, right? For our chromosomes. Bacteria have one circular circle for their actual chromosome. So that's interesting that our <clears throat> mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own genome. And then they also have um, ribosomes, ribosomes and their own ribosomes. Their ribosomes are 70S ribosomes. Eukaryotic cells outside of like mitochondria and chloroplasts, like you and I, outside of those two organelles, um, they, the outside of that, we have 80S ribosomes. And the way that they work is how they work in eukaryotes, but mitochondria and chloroplasts have their very own ribosomes inside of them. And they resemble bacteria type ribosomes. Isn't that cool? Like, I think it's so nuts. So that's all the information anyways that we have on the endosymbiotic, endosymbiotic theory, but it's pretty strong evidence. It's hard to prove altogether, but there you go. Okay, now we're going to start breaking it down into the groups. This is a good chart to let you guys know. Um, if I were to ask you guys, you know, which of the following are unicellular, which one have to be, you know, multicellular, this is a good little table to get you oriented there. The protozoa are always, always just one cell, just unicellular. Fungi and algae, these guys can be unicellular or multicellular. Okay, either one. And then we have the helminths. These are like the worms. Okay. These are always multicellular. They do have like a larval or egg form that can be unicellular, but their, you know, main, um, you know, end game breeding form is going to be multicellular every time. So if we were to look at the list that we're given here, this should be an easy one for you guys. Um, which of these is not a eukaryote, right? Cause I just keep talking about it. So you should know at this point, um, remember algae, we just mentioned algae is a eukaryote. It can be multi or it can be unicellular. We have fungi that can be multi or unicellular. We have plants. I mean, come on, that's obviously going to be like a multicellular type of thing. So that's not a prokaryote. So, um, bacteria are not eukaryotes. Bacteria are prokaryotes. What's the other prokaryote? Archaea. There's only two things that fall into prokaryote. Bacteria archaea. Lump everything else that's alive into eukaryote. Just remember that. Viruses are not alive. And I'll keep saying it and keep saying it. All right, so eukaryote cells, what kind of features do they have? We have on the left, things that are found in all of them. And then on the right, things that are found in some of them. So I'm going to talk about the ones that are in all of the cells. The cytoplasmic membrane is just the membrane holding everything in. The nucleus is what holds the genetic inf information in. It's got a membrane around it. Uh, we have the membrane bound mitochondria. That's the energy powerhouse, the endoplasmic reticulum, where we're make, making and um, modifying and packaging up proteins. The Golgi apparatus, where we're going to make putting things into vesicles and moving them around. The vacuoles for storing like water and stuff like that. The cytoskeleton for structure and the glycocalyx, which is like, we can have that either as a slime layer or something like that, or we can have that as um, an extracellular matrix. Now, everything has all of those. On the right, in some eukaryotic cells, we have a cell wall, like we do in plants and fungi. They're made of different things, but they do. Um, locomotor appendages like flagella, we've already introduced one kind with bacteria, but they're much different in eukaryotic cells, much more complicated. And then chloroplasts for a photosynthesis. So this is what a eukaryotic cell would look like. These are all those parts. If you want to see visualization of how they're organized within the cell, I'm not as concerned about make you label them in a picture um, and just say, what is this? I'm not going to do that. I don't think that's a useful thing. You're never going to use that anywhere in any, at any point in your life. But, um, you know, later on, we're, we're showing pictures of things and I'm talking about it. It, it is useful to come back to here if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, like picture wise. So there is that information and a comparison in that um, lower right corner down here uh, with the bacteria, bacterial cell and similar relative size change. 
So flagella and eukaryotes. Eukaryotic versus bacterial flagella. Eukaryotic flagella are 10 times thicker and much more complex. Like I said, they are covered by an extension of the cell membrane and they don't spin. Remember we saw that motor guy for the bacteria, they just spin around. In eukaryote, eukaryotes, the flagella can actually whip around, okay? They don't spin. So they're long sheathed, sheathed with the membrane. Um, they're cylindrical and they have uh, regularly spaced hollow microtubules kind of for support and structure in a nine plus two arrangement. What do I mean by that? Don't be so quite so concerned about it because when you see this, it makes sense what I'm saying. This is the nine plus two arrangement. So you can see here, we have these um, sets of two here and then groups of nine of them around to give structure to it. And then in the middle, there's more. So um, another two. So you can see it here when you were looking at the electron micrograph that uh, these are the microtubules like a cross section through that flagella. You can see what the ones on the side. Uh, pretty cool stuff. So moving on to the cilia in eukaryotes, um, they have a similar structure to the flagella, but they're just much smaller and shorter and a lot more numerous, okay? You need a lot of them, usually for filter feeding. So swishing around whatever you got going on around you to help collect like sediment or whatever is going on in like the usually like pond water or something. Right. So that is what they're going to be doing. And they can also allow for actual movement of the cells in a way, but it's not super efficient, um, but it is available. So the glycocalyx is the outermost boundary that comes into contact with the environment. This in our cells, it, this is important because we don't think of our cells as having like a capsule or something necessarily. Our cells don't, but necessary that in general, okay, in general, they don't. But um, we do have an extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix is what helps the cells uh, kind of, I don't wanna say stick together, but like adhere, adhere together, that makes sense. Um, how the cells are gonna adhere together and form like an organ structure. Because that is how, you know, they know kind of, we have units of organs. We're not just a big old mash mush of this area does pancreatic stuff. No, 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 they're actual organs that are separated. They're separated because the cells are sticking together based on their extracellular matrix, telling them that this is how we stick together, right? So same with the bacteria, they are composed of polysaccharides, different ones, but still polysaccharides. Remember guys, remember what that is? Poly is many, saccharide is just like saccharin, it's like sugar, okay? So many sugar units repeating. Um, uh, what do they look like? Okay, appearance. Network, they could be a network of fibers of, you know, kind of a webbing sort of a look to them, or they could be a slime layer or, the, or they can be a capsule. Now the slime layer and the capsule tends to be for things like, um, we're talking about like protozoa and maybe um, like, you know, the single celled organisms. We're not really talking about like our cells as much with that, right? All right, boundary structures. So we don't, like we said, some cells have cell walls, right? Um, fungi and algae do, and we're not talking about plants. Plants do as well, but we are not getting into plants because they're not part of like pathogens. So we're not gonna get into like, they're not really not, not interesting on a microbiology level for us. So you want to learn about plants, go take botany. I don't know about plants. I'm not good with that stuff. So we'll talk about um, the stuff that's little that you need a microscope to see in microbiology, right? So cell walls for our purposes are found in fungi and algae. Now that shouldn't be too hard for you guys to remember because algae and fungi are the most plant-like of all of the you know eukaryote groups that we're gonna be talking about. So protozoa, we're, we'll be thinking about like these single cell organisms that are like, you know, malaria and stuff like that. Whereas um, when we're talking about helminths, that's the worms. Which one of all of those would you think would have cell walls when I tell you that plants have cell walls? Fungi and algae, because they're most similar to that, yeah? Now, uh, they do have a different chemical composition than the bacteria ones. They're not gonna have peptidoglycan structures. When we talk about um, some of these guys are gonna have chitin as, as what's making up their cell wall to make them strong. Um, other ones you know, will have cellulose, but that's basically what that would be made of for eukaryotes, not peptidoglycan, right? Still structural support though. The cytoplasmic membrane, what holds everything together, just that membrane is a lipid bilayer that contains sterols. Sterols do include things like cholesterol. 
that creates the stability in the membrane. Um, they are selectively permeable, just like the bacterial ones were. They can let water move in and out by osmosis and some smaller molecules as well, really small ones with really tiny ones. But um, then we have special uh, ways to channel things in and out of there. So that would be either through um, that active diffusion, if you need to have energy to go against a gradient, or it could be like a passive diffusion. So we can use that by facilitated diffusion where we're, you can't get in normally, but we have a channel that will um, allow you to pass through, but only with the gradient, right? So that's what we had talked about previously as well. All right, um, moving on, right, okay. Tran yeah, transporting things. Uh, microbes, which of these usually do not have a cell wall? Boy, I, I, bet, I, I bet you were listening to me when I just said this, right? So if I were to just leave this, you'd be for sure and already know the answer. You don't need to know to tell you, right? Because we just said bacteria have peptidoglycan cell walls. And we just said that the fungi and the algae, which are eukaryotes, that they also have cell walls. Because I said, remember that they have cell walls by reminding yourself they're like plants, which we know have cell walls. They have to, right? They're so rigid. Like, look at a tree, man. So, um, so that leaves us with protozoa. It would have to be protozoa. Sorry, my nose is just like, got runny all of a sudden. All right. The nucleus, we call it the control center. It's where our genome, our uh, chromosomes are going to be packaged up. They say a compact sphere. Um, it's not as important. It will be the most prominent organelle in the whole um, cell, just because that's where we're going to take all of that genetic information. Even if you're only using a few genes at a time, um, we still have to have all that information there because when we make daughter cells, they might need to be using other genes and so on and so forth, right? So you always carry all of that genetic information within your nucleus. The nucleolus is going to have an intense stain. You can see down here. So um, this orange area is the nucleus. And then down here, this part that's darker, that's the nucleolus. And what is the nucleolus? That's where we have ribosomal RNA synthesis. If you need to make protein, the things that read the coding essentially for that, right? So it's like if you had like the original blueprint, that's your genome. And then you're gonna make a copy of part of it because you need to build, I don't know, the bedroom now. So you make the bedroom copy. And then, um, I don't know why I use a house, but that's what we went with just suddenly, I'm sorry. And you make a bedroom copy and then you take that, that's messenger RNA, it contains the message of the bedroom, that gene that codes for the bedroom, right? You take that to the ribosome, the ribosome reads that message and creates as a result protein based on whatever that message says, right? So now that protein is essentially building the house. So we didn't have any house at all or any of its parts before. Now we can take that message and it's telling us, put these together, put this together next, put this together next, put this together next. And then at the end of it all, we'll have a bedroom. And eventually those bedroom and the other bedroom and you know whatever bathroom and all that come together and that would be you know a protein essentially like a functional enzyme unit or however you want to look at it but that's a, just one analogy for it okay but ribosomes are the ones that read it they make the protein so they're doing all that heavy lifting um, they're made of ribosomal RNA and a little bit of protein too of their own, but so you need a lot of them, right? They're constantly, you're constantly needing to make proteins. I mean, each of your genes codes for a message that is a protein. Um, so you had a lot of protein going on in your whole body. Um, and that could tell your proteins to put like lipids and stuff together and whatever, but like still it's going to be essentially protein, making proteins from your genes. That's how we read it. So chromatin, chromatin is eukaryotic chromosomes um, and how we store it and everything like that. In eukaryotes, we wind our DNA around these stupid proteins called histones. I don't like this stuff. This is not my thing. This is like cell biology stuff, but, I'm, but you get the rundown. Histones is for storing up the DNA. We wind it up tight for storage. We wind everything up really tight because we don't want anything getting mixed up whenever we go through mitosis. Same similar thing that's going to happen with meiosis. So mitosis, we're going to make new 
cells from like I have one cell and it's going to make a copy of itself. And now we have two cells that are identical to the original. So identical copies. Meiosis, which is the sex cells, does not do that. We're going to have a few steps of this whole process, and that's going to end up with different cells. But that's, you don't need to know it for microbiology. Okay. Um, moving on to the actual cell process. Uh, there's a lot going on in here. You might want to be familiar with what's going on with the nucleus. So, okay, hold on. I'm going to write it out for you. So what's going on with the nucleus? What's going on with the chromosomes? Um, maybe even the centrioles. Which I'll talk about those, what they are. And then even like as far as the, maybe the cell membrane. These are the things that you wanna focus on as far as understanding what's going on in the cell cycle, okay? So if we're gonna look at, um, I can't see my, I can't see my guy, there it is. Um, if we're gonna start here, I don't know why it went in it. Okay, yeah, okay, there it is. So here's our, we're gonna start with a cell, whatever, or an original progenitor cell, sorry, here. And it's gonna go you know, um, through interface. And that's essentially like getting ready for everything to happen, right? We're getting all of our supplies together, making sure everything's in order. Got it all, ready to go kids. Okay, we're gonna start loading up the car. We're going to grandma's. So, you know, kids got everything. We're getting ready to load up the car and whatever. So you see these guys that are hanging out, um, these little weird little, uh, they look like, I don't even know how to describe little pills or something. Those are the um, centrioles. Now what's a centriole? A centriole is where the spindle fibers are gonna attach. Well, that doesn't make any sense to you either. But when you look at this picture of what's going on, so when we look at the nucleus here, this is the nucleus in all of this, that purple part. That's the nucleus where our chromosomes are. And you can see when you go from interphase into prophase that the nucleus we've got this squiggly mess and now we're we've tightened up all of our chromosomes that's what i mean by you know consolidating tightening up make sure it's really in place this is where we get that idea of our chromosomes looking like x's so it's like you have this is one chromosome and then we make a, a, a copy of it so we've got one copy and this is the exact copy of it and they're attached in the middle by something called um a centromere Okay. Well, um, that's cool. Right. So they've tightened up all of that and we are getting ready to, we're getting our spindle fibers ready, right. Between our centri centrioles. So that's going on in the pro phase. Then in metaphase, I'm not as concerned about, you know, early versus the regular. So I want you to understand metaphase is middle. We have lined up all of those chromosomes into the middle of the cell using the spindle fibers and everything like that and the centrioles will go at each end. So now you can kind of see what's getting ready to happen. We're lining up what is one copy and what is the other copy. And we're essentially getting them all lined up in the middle. And what are we gonna do with it, do you think? We're gonna pull them apart. That's why we have one copy and the other copy. Each cell gets a copy. That's why we have already duplicated this and it's already been taken care of. So that's done. Um, so that's what's lining, we're lining up metaphase. That's the middle. It's a, going on in the middle of all this, as well as lining things up in the middle of all of this. Okay, so we line everything up in the middle in metaphase. Middle is metaphase. And then when next we have anaphase, and I don't need you to know early versus late. I do want you to just know that anaphase is where we're pulling the chromosomes apart. So one copy on the other side, the other copy on the other. They're identical copies. They just pulled apart into the other side. Okay, then we have the telophase. Telophase is where we're going to have, we're going to remake our membrane around the nucleus. We're going to get, make sure each side has their own thing going on and um, everything's getting ready to pinch off in the middle to make separate daughter cells with that, what they call the cleavage furrow. So that's where we're going to have uh, pinching in 
and you know creation of two cells instead of one. So, okay, we see how that works, right? So um, you get the idea of that. So one way you guys can remember this, and this is what I learned from Dr. Shearer. Um, he had this thing, um, his little anagram, somebody else told me a better one. I think she's the new, uh, she'll be our new professor in biology. Um, but she told me one um, that was even better, but I can't remember what it is. So I'll have to ask her about it. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, so pee mat. Your puppy's going to go pee on the mat. You don't want the puppy to pee on the mat. But that's where the puppy peed, it peed, it peed on the mat. So pee mat, right? Or someone will have like pee pee mat for, you know, pre pro phase and all this. But um, yeah, so you should not be peeing on the, on the mat. So, um, but if you did, you would say that I pee on the mat. That helps you remember it. But P mat is really the big part of it, right? So before that, yes, interface has to happen, but the P mat is the big, big daddy part. That's where we're actually getting ready to divide our cells in mitosis, right? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Repeat it, you will get it. It will stick in there forever. You will never forget it. Okay, moving on. So that's, we already talked about this. So I, I told you guys to try to remember what the nuclear membrane is doing um, in each step, what the centrioles were doing in each step and what the chromosomes were doing in each step. So I would go through and just make sure the big things are, you know, with the prophase, you're just getting ready for everything. In the metaphase, you no longer have a nucleus and we're getting lined up. In anaphase, we're pulling things apart. And then in telophase, we reform our nucleus and we're making new daughter cells, right? Um, and then, you know, as far as the, what the centrioles are doing, for the most part, in prophase, that's only where we're like getting things ready. Um, and in metaphase, they're going to be on the ends. And then, um, you know, pulling in the spindle fibers. And then anaphase, they're pulling in the spindle fibers on the ends. And then telophase, they're still on the ends, but they are essentially like now, if you can see better, I want to go back to the other picture. Um, they aren't having to do so much with those spindle fibers. Now they are, wow, that is an eraser. Oh, that is, that was the wrong side of my thing. I didn't know that could do that. I learned a thing just now. Um, but yeah, that they're just chilling. They're done. Okay, that's that. Whew. Sorry, I didn't, I could go back to this video. I'll show you guys this boring video. Let's watch this boring video, shall we? During interphase of the cell cycle, the genetic material of the cell is found in the form of chromatin and located within the nucleus of the cell, which is surrounded by the nuclear envelope. During the S stage of interphase, DNA replication takes place, and thus the cell leaving interphase and entering mitosis already has replicated its genetic information. In addition to the replicated genetic information, Interphase cells that are about to divide also replicate their centrosomes. In animal cells, these centrosomes are formed from centriole pairs. As cells leave interphase and begin prophase, the first stage of mitosis, the chromosomes begin to condense. The nuclear envelope begins to vesiculate, and the centrosomes migrate to opposite ends of the cells to define the two poles. During prophase, the mitotic spindle apparatus begins to form by the polymerization of tubulin proteins. This creates microtubules that emanate from each centrosome. Chromosomes completely condense such that sister chromatids formed from the replicated genetic information and joined at their centromeres are clearly visible. During prometaphase, the nuclear envelope completely breaks down and the mitotic spindle is formed. Polar microtubules extend from both poles and overlap with each other. The sister chromatids become attached to the mitotic spindle via kinetochore microtubules it's that attach to the kinetochores, know, which are but... bound to the centromeres. As prometaphase is nearing its end, the sister chromatids are observed to jerk back and forth between the two poles. During metaphase, the sister chromatids become localized in a region called the metaphase plate. Once the chromosomes have aligned at the metaphase plate, metaphase is complete. When metaphase is completed, anaphase begins. 
the sister chromatids separate and each chromatid is now linked to only one pole via a kinetochore microtubule. The kinetochore microtubules shorten, and the individual chromatids, now called chromosomes, are drawn to the poles. Toward the end of anaphase, the polar microtubules push against each other and cause the two poles to be moved farther away from each other. Each daughter cell will receive the same complement of chromosomes as was originally found in the mother cell, thus assuring that each daughter cell gets an identical copy of genetic information. During telophase, the chromosomes decondense and most of the microtubules depolymerize. Portions of nuclear membrane surround each individual chromosome, creating vesicles. The vesicles fuse with each other to create a nucleus containing all of the chromosomes at one pole of the cell. In animal cells, cytokinesis, or cell division, involves the formation of a cleavage furrow. The plasma membrane is observed to constrict and eventually separates the cell into two daughter cells. The daughter cells then enter interphase, where growth and enlargement occurs, leading to either preparation for another mitosis or differentiation and specialization occurs. Okay. Uh -oh. <clears throat> Get this out of the way. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's checkpoints along the way, right? Essentially what you just really just need to know about these checkpoints, I need you to know about G1, which is gap one or gap two or whatever. And when DNA synthesis occurs, where there are checkpoints, what's important about knowing that is that, um, you know, once we go through metaphase and we get all of those chromosomes lined up, there's a checkpoint to make sure that all of the spindles are attached. Now that's important because if you don't split apart those duplicated chromosomes, then your resulting cell is going to have too many chromosomes and that can be detrimental to the function of the cell. Additionally, um, you just want to make sure that everything's lining up right and working the way that it is supposed to, because if it isn't, that means something else is wrong and we need to figure out what it is. Okay, so next is the G1 checkpoint. So I mean, these are internal like cell checkpoints. The cell checks these things out. It has ways of doing that. You don't need to understand it, but know that they do. So check it out, okay? Um, so in G1, we're just checking to make sure we have enough stuff for everything to continue, as well as checking for any DNA damage, because you don't want to start making a double copy of your DNA um, if it's damaged, right? I want to copy that damage, right? So make sure everything's in good shape. Then we go through DNA synthesis. That's literally just making a copy. So now we have that X-shaped chromosome. So we are originally, what, are, what is happening? I know where you're, I know you're somewhere. Where did you go? There it is. Okay. So um, originally your chromosome would just look like this, but when you're getting ready to divide and everything's all consolidated and ready to go and your chromosomes are ready and you're going to make your synthesis, DNA synthesis, here's your copy. Now it looks like a K, but I meant for it to look more like this, like that and an X, right? That still looks like a K, but you guys get the idea, right? So anyways, um, you get the idea. Um, so Right, and then G G2, so we've synthesized, we made our copy of our DNA. Now we're just gonna make sure the cell is getting bigger, getting to be the right size so we can actually go through with this. And that DNA replication did take place before we start moving on. That's important because cells that like are gonna have cancer or something like that are growing out of control, unchecked. If you don't check those spots, you're gonna have all this like mess of things gone wrong with the DNA and you know, wrong, um, you have damaged DNA that didn't get checked. You don't, didn't duplicate here. You have an extra chromosome there. Um, any of that can go wrong in the cell cycle and then um, lead to cancer or cancer can cause any of that to happen because you're, you can lose any of those checkpoints at any time. So that's a bad deal. So what is the nature of a typical eukaryotic genome? A typical eukaryotic gene, we didn't talk about this in too much detail, is going to be linear, right? That's what the X's are. As I said, it was a line. So it's linear. And we know that humans have how many chromosomes? We have 23 pairs for 20 or for 23 pairs for 46 overall. The two last ones are the sex chromosomes. So yeah. 
But um, so that's what it's gonna, gonna be. It's gonna be multiple linear DNA molecules. We have several of them. Okay, the endoplasmic reticulum. What do I need you to know about this? It's a series of tunnels. When I say tunnels, membranes looped up around one another. It's for transport and it's for storage of protein, essentially. Why do we need it to be you know, all lined up like this and, and weird all like squiggles? Like it's all like, it's like, what is it? I'm really bad at finding my cursor, guys. I'm not good at it even when I have the, the pen. Okay, um, so it's gonna look like, no. Well, okay, yeah, that's probably the better way to look at it. So you can see here on the left, this is the endoplasmic reticulum, this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's rough because it's dotted with all these ribosomes. That's what those dots are, they're ribosomes. So why is it folded up like that? That's to give us the most surface area that we can get and the ribosomes will make the protein and feed it into the space in there. So that's called the cistern. And then that can be you know, packaged up and everything by the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. So. Rough ER, ribosomes for making protein. Smooth ER, no ribosomes. We're talking about synthesis and storage of non-protein molecules, or sometimes, um, you know, adding on other groups to the proteins, changing them up a little bit, adding maybe sugars and stuff to them. So we saw the left was the rough ER. Um, the gray picture here, we have the uh, electron micrograph of it. It's a lot of it, right? So it, see all those folds in there and it's a rough ER. You can tell because it's got kind of dots around the surface of it. And then down here on the bottom, we have the ribosomes. This is one messenger RNA, just one messenger RNA. So that was what gene that we went and made a copy of that gene to bring it out to actually start making that gene's product, right? So now the ribosomes have hooked on. One ribosome started, this one, started reading it and now it has made this much protein when it had moved down a little bit ribosome number two started reading it and it's they will start it moving down and now we have a third ribosome coming on all on one mrna so we can get tons of protein being made off of that one mrna at all at once okay and there's a word for it and we're going to talk about it in a minute so the golgi apparatus is the next thing it's kind of always after a little bit of the uh, er we do some modifying of proteins in there uh, but mostly we're talking about making vesicles and um, that's going to be making vesicles for transporting things around the cell or exocytosis. If you need to, you know, exocytose anything out of the cell, you would go through the Golgi apparatus. Um, that's some little, little vesicles. And just like, like, you, like if you went in your body and you had like water or spit or whatever you want to call it. And then you went um, to go spit it out in somebody's face. <laughs> That would be like a, an example of something similar to what happens with exocytosis. Okay, if you took something from in and then you just went and spit, spit it out. So that's what's going on there. Um, and then condensing vesicles and stuff like that. We're talking about like lysosomes. A lysosome is a vesicle that contains stuff in there to break down other cells like bad guys. Okay, so that comes from the Golgi apparatus as well. This is a picture of the Golgi. The Golgi is the golden color one. The ER is the purple colored one. They look pretty similar to one another. They're just a little bit more like longer layers lined up upon one another, but yeah, they look very similar. The nucleus, the ER and the Golgi, those three all together, we, we would consider those nature's assembly line, right? For eukaryotic cells. Um, remember bacteria don't do this. They're prokaryotes. They do all this just hanging out either in their cytoplasm just reminding you guys so that you can know the difference. Prokaryotes, this is just going on in the cytoplasm or along the inside of their inner membrane. This is only eukaryotes because then we have membrane bound organelles. We can have things compartmentalized going on in their compartments, right? So genetic information from the nucleus, protein will be synthesized by the ribosomes into the rough ER. Then we can transport them to the Golgi apparatus so they can be chemically modified. Maybe we need to add like a fatty acid group to it or whatever. And it would package it into the vesicle and send it wherever it needs to go, either in the cell or outside of the cell. That's the assembly line. So this is just a picture depiction of what I just told you. Um, we started, one day this won't be difficult for me. We started here um, in the nucleus and moved into the ER, which is like this part down here. And then we went down into the Golgi apparatus down here. And then it went, 
There it is. Out. That's like secretion. Okay. By a secretory vesicle in the Golgi. So that's just how things are made in your cells. All right. What sorts of vesicles are there? Lysosomes for breaking bad guys down. Literally, that's what they do. They originate from the Golgi. They're for breaking bad guys down. And then we also have vesicles called vacuoles. Vacuoles are big old membrane bound sacs um, containing fluids or solid particles for digestion or excretion or just to store. Like plants, when they get a lot of water, they can store a lot of their water in their vacuoles and save it for later. Um, this is lysosomes video. Oh, right, this isn't a touchpad, like a mouse. Get together one. Lysosomes are membrane bound vesicles that contain hydrolytic enzymes. The hydrolytic enzymes degrade proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and carbohydrates, and are formed in the endoplasmic reticulum. These enzymes are then transported to the Golgi apparatus by transport vesicles. The lysosomes arise from the Golgi apparatus. When particles such as viruses or bacteria are ingested by phagocytosis, the lysosome fuses with the particle containing vesicle called a phagosome and delivers the hydrolytic enzymes. Okay. Oh, I thought it was done. <laughs> Lysosomes also fuse with organelles such as old mitochondria. This results in the destruction and recycling of these structures. Cool. Okay, um, so mitochondria, th very important, probably the most important part of the entire eukaryotic cell and what we are going to be learning here, especially in the next unit. Mitochondria is the energy generator of the cell. Um, remember, we think they came from prokaryotes originally. They have their own DNA. They have their own ribosomes that look like bacterial ones, and um, they have the two membranes and all that. So mitochondria are organelles in eukaryotic cells that supply the bulk of the energy for the entire cells. We have usually a lot of them in like muscle cell. You have a ton of them, right? Because that they need a lot of energy, your cells and your muscles. So what are the, how are they structured? The cristae are the folds on the inner membranes. This is pretty similar to what we were seeing, like with the folds of the ER, the folds of the Golgi. We have similar folds going on inside of the mitochondria, again, to just to increase surface area. Um, so with the folds in your brain to increase surface area, right? So um, these folds on the inner membrane will hold proteins that we call electron carriers and stuff like that for aerobic respiration. Big, 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 big concept, okay? Definitely, when we get into studying that in unit two, we're going to get into the details of it. You need to understand that because we are really going to get into the details of it later on in the lab. And I know that sounds, uh, that's not really, yes, it is related. And I promise, like, if you can understand what's going on in the lecture, um, you'll understand the lab better. If you understand the lab better, you'll understand the lecture better. So that's the idea with that. If you can understand the concepts here. You will understand that better and it'll help a lot. So the matrix um, is just like the inside of all those folds that'll hold ribosomes, the DNA and um, enzymes that are used in metabolism for the um, mitochondrion itself. So this is pictures of mitochondria. You see all those folds in there, just like the ER and everything. Um, but essentially they're just used for, um, you know, those electron transport carriers. So there are other proteins there for aerobic respiration. We just shoot electrons down that whole chain. And as they move, they'll pump hydrogen ions outside of that membrane and we get a gradient of hydrogen ions. And then they'll come back through a channel and that channel, whenever it's called ATP synthase, and that channel, whenever it gets um, the hydrogen ions moving back in through it, it will help that protein channel phosphorylate or add a phosphor, phosphate group, phosphor, phosphorylate, add a phosphate group to ADP, turning it into ATP. And remember, ATP is the energy molecule of the cell that we can break down to ADP. And then um, when we do that, releases a ton of energy um, and allows proteins to you know, change chemically and do whatever they're trying to do. So that's how all of that works. That's where all that comes from. That's what energy means. It's all just for more chemical reactions. How this will react with this based on its charge and whatever, that's 
all that is ever going on in any of this. <laughs> That's the, that is the breakdown of this. So chloroplasts, these are photosynthesis machines. Essentially they have special pigments in them that react to sunlight when, the state, when they uh, interact with like, you know, the radiation from the light, the photons and um, even the UV radiation, that stuff will activate those pigments and, and cause um, a reaction there that they can use to create energy. Um, they can use um, carbon dioxide and then um, produce oxygen as a byproduct. And then that's important because obviously we need oxygen in the electron transport chain as our final electron uh, acceptor, but that's why it's aerobic. So here's, here's chloroplasts. They're just stacked up membranes, essentially. Everything's going on, again, on those increased surface area membranes. Um, they have their own DNA. A granum is a big stack. A thylakoid is an individual, like coin, essentially, of the stack of coins. The stroma is everything that's just hanging out, out um, outside. And yeah, cool. That's a chloroplast. So like we had said earlier, when, with the endosymbiotic theory, these guys, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, divide independently from the cell, almost binary fission. They have their own circular DNA. They have bacteria-sized 70S ribosomes as opposed to the 80S of eukaryotes, right? So that's all of that comes together. We think that that's where they came from was prokaryote that we had as a symbiotic relationship, endo inside. All right, moving on, ribosomes are not technically an organelle because they aren't membrane bound, but they do quite a lot for us. So they get their own little feature here. Ribosomes are protein synthesizers. They're gonna read the mRNA message and crank out protein. They're all throughout the cell. They're attached to the rough ER. They're inside mitochondria and chloroplasts as well. Um, remember in um, prokaryotes, like bacteria and archaea is just floating around in the cytoplasm, okay? That's where the ribosomes are there. Polyribosomes, like I had shown you before, that mRNA with all those ribosomes, like one started and then when there's space, another one came on and then another one came on and they were all just making the same protein. That's a polyribosome. So our uh, ribosomes in eukaryotes, are similar to the bacterial ones. They have a large and a small part. Um, they function very similarly. Uh, ours are 80S in size. It's a combination of a 60S and a 40S. I'm not gonna ask you that, but you might wanna know that eukaryotes are 80S and that prokaryotes are 70S. You might wanna know that, you might. So this is that polyribosome. And then this is like the one that I was showing before and what is going on here. Essentially um, we're on the uh, membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And we are reading along an mRNA strand and those ribosomes are just coming along and uh, they start out down here. There's a start that allows them to attach down here. And then they just add on every three nucleotide sequences on that mRNA strand is gonna equal one amino acid. Amino acid gets added on, it moves to the next three. An amino acid gets added on, it moves to the next three, it reads it, the amino acid that corresponds gets added on and so on and so forth until we have a ton of amino acids added together. Do you remember what that's called? That's the primary structure of the protein, right? Of the peptide anyways. That's the primary structure. That's just the amino acid sequence. The secondary structure are when those amino acids start interacting with one another directly. That's gonna be the alpha helices. That's right, in the beta sheets. <laughs> um, definitely know those. And then the tertiary is when all that's gonna, um, you know, fold up and interact with one another um, and create like sulfide, disulfide bonds. And then the quaternary is when the subunits come together to form a functional protein, okay? Just remember just reprising all of that while we are here. The cytoskeleton is literally what it sounds like. It's going to create like the, the shape and structure of the cell. It's also gonna allow the organelles to be held in place where they should be. Um, we can move RNA around. We can move the vesicles around this way. Um, you've seen like a little video of like the protein kind of walking along and it's carrying a big old thing on its back. That's what's going on. It's, whiting, it's walking along the cytoskeleton, um, taking it to another area. Um, there's three main types of filaments involved in the cytoskeleton. We're, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next picture to show them to you. So we have the actin filaments. They're just going from top to bottom here. The actin 
filaments are the tiny, tiny, tinier ones that you can kind of barely see. They're like the bluish ones. The intermediate ones are these kind of reddish ones. And then the, the big daddies are the microtubules, the orange ones. So those all work together and interact with one another to create the whole cytoskeleton, okay? These are the similarities and differences between bacteria, eukarya, and viruses. Um, as you can see, virus is not really very much similar to anything else because they're not alive. They're not cells. How can you even compare them? That's not even fair. But, um, but yeah, so this is that. If you guys want to go through, this is a good chart to look at as far as all the detail with uh, bacteria versus bacteria and archaea versus the prokaryotes versus the eukaryotes, okay? What they have and what they don't have and what's different. So we're going to break it down into the groups. Um, we're going to classify these things because we classify everything. Why wouldn't we? Um, the four kingdoms that are involved. Uh, so we, we talked about the domains, right? Do you remember what they were? There's three of them. Archaea, bacteria, that's the prokaryotes, and then eukaryotes, that's the third, okay? Their own things. Then we break up eukaryotes into the kingdoms. Animals, plants, fungi, prote protista. Animalia, things we're gonna talk about in microbiology, with regards to that, other than, you know, the people getting affected by these things or animals getting affected by these things, um, the helminths, that's the worms, the flatworms, the flukes, stuff like that. Then the plants, we're not really going to talk about those. The fungi, we are like with molds and things like that. Um, you do, would want to be familiar with that. And yeasts, yeasts are fungi. So we will be talking about stuff, stuff like that, like with yeast infections and more like athlete's foot and ringworm and stuff like that. Then protista. Protista, which is just everything else. The algae and the protozoa. The algae and the protozoa. They can be um, unicellular. Little bit, unicellular. Um, algae can be multicellular. Protozoa are always unicellular. I want to move on. The, the fungi. There's a lot of them. We have the macroscopic. That's the big ones. Things you can see out with your naked eye. Mushrooms and all of that. Then the microscopic ones, the molds and the yeast. This is how uh, we would break this down. The yeasts have a round or an oval shape and they use asexual reproduction. They're just making new copies of the original cell. Um, they, they do this thing with where they bud off of things. Um, and then we have the other fungi that go through this stuff called hyphae and other ones that are dimorphic. So the hyphae ones have the long threads and filamentous fungi or molds, like the ones that are furry looking, that's hyphae, okay? Pseudo hyphae is something that yeast, certain kinds of yeast can do, and it can look similar with how the cells are lined up, but they're technically not true hyphae because they're yeast. Then we have the dimorphic forms where they can take either form. Uh, just looking at a yeast, you can just see the cells budding off of one another. I mean, I'm not really going to go into too much detail, but like they'll bud off kind of not in the same shape or size. They get little buds come off. They're not the same size and they'll just like pop off and whatever. So, um, but yeah, that's how the fungi, that's how the yeasts will bud. Then we have the other ones that do the hyphae. We have the septate kind where we have divisions in between cells. Each of these is a cell. So these are nuclei. This is a nucleus and each cell technically should, should have one nucleus. Um, and then the, the, I can't say it, co-anocytic, yes, co-anocytic, I guess, um, that, that type of hyphae, they don't have, they don't have divisions in between their cells anymore. That's broken down. So they're all just kind of one big old mess, kind of sharing everything within one another, okay? What do they eat? Fungi, they are heterotrophic, uh, forms that will require nutrient nutrients from wide variety of whatever, like we do. Okay. That's heterotrophic. Eat a lot of different stuff. Then we have the saprobes. The saprobes eat dead things and exclusively dead things. And then the parasites, they are the ones that live on bodies of living animals or plants causing harm. Remember that's, that's how the relationship that's going on. Parasites are causing harm to the hosts. So we have the saprobes over here on the left side. And then we have over here on the right side, this would be a parasitic for, form of a fungus athlete's foot, right? Uh, okay, most fungi grow in loose associations or even colonies. Um, that would include like, okay, we have the mycelium, 
interwoven masses of hyphae, right? Just a whole lot, a mess of freaking hyphae going on. The septa, where the hyphae are divided into segments or, or cross wall. And then spores, where they have fungal reproducing bodies that'll fly off and create new fungi. All right. Oh, I feel like that was a weird transition, right? Yeah, it was. That's why. Okay. So this is how they will grow in their colonies. So on the left here, we have the hyphae reproduction um, where they can break off and whatever to make new hyphae. So um, that's what's going on there. Um, and then they, these ones decided to form spores. They broke open, they spread their spore and went on to the next one nearby. And then so on and so forth, they can go through the same cycles over and over again. And that can create spreading. That can spread to, you know, new pieces of bread or it can spread to the one next to them or, you know, ones that are a little bit farther away and whatever. So that's, that's mold. Fungi. Fungi have um, complex and successful reproductive strategies. They have a simple outward growth of existing hyphae. Um, they can have fragmentation, which is breaking off and then creating a whole new colony off of that. So it will just, you can just grow big or you can grow, I don't know why that needs a sound effect, or you can have pieces come off to make new ones growing, or we can have a reproductive form um, where we have spore formulation, form, formation. Um, to create new things that way. Okay. Now spores with fungi are for reproduction. They're alive. They're going to go on to make more fungi. Um, this is not anywhere near the same thing as reproductive. And uh, sorry, these are not anywhere near the same thing as bacterial endospores. And I do want to go back here really quick to their nutrition. Okay. They're heterotrophic. They get uh, nutrients from a variety of substances, saprobes, breaking down dead things, parasites, bodies of animals or plants, right? Where on here do you see that they are photosynthetic? Where on there do you see they're photosynthetic? That was just the worst that I've ever written anything. Um, nowhere. You don't see it because they don't have chloroplasts, okay? Fungi, no chloroplasts, no chloroplasts. They are not plants. They are not plants. They are not, they are not plants. Fungi are not plants. They don't have chloroplasts. Everybody gets that confused for some reason. Okay, so I did wanna say that. Endospores from bacteria, moving back to this. Endospores are like for the harsh conditions so they can survive harsh conditions. Those are like alive still technically endospores but they're just, just barely, right? They're just waiting for good times to come back. If we're reproducing in the fungi situation, they've got good conditions because they're reproducing. So these are not anywhere near the same thing as a bacterial version, okay? So we can have spore formation in kind of two different ways. The sporangiospores, um, which is cleavage within a sporangium. Sporangium, so I would just say, look at it this way. We have the conidiospores and the sporangiospores. The sporangiospores, where is it? There is are gonna bust out of this little guy in the sac. The conidia spores, no sac, okay? Know that. Why do they need sexual spores? Just for genetic variation. And that allows maybe to adapting um, to environments a little bit better. That's all it is. Maybe had any new, new advantages based on those changes. Um, how do we identify them? And how do we grow them? We have special media for them. That's all you need to know. We observe them microscopically as well as with our naked eye. We'll talk about how, like what the actual, you know, hyphae would look like, the color, how big it grows and everything like that um, versus looking at it in the microscope, trying to see what kind of, uh, is it a sporangiospore or is it the conidiospore type? And that sort of a thing, right? You can't really see the actual sexual spores themselves, but the structures um, involved, you can. And we can also look at the hyphae, the colony tech, like everything about it as well as genetic information. We have pathogenic fungi. These are the ones that, um, so we have different kinds, right? So we have the ones where infection can occur through accidental contact. Typically that's what's gonna happen with fungi in general, okay? The primary pathogens will make anybody sick. The opportunistic ones, however, are gonna attack you when your immune system isn't looking, like when you're down, like whenever you're um, unwell. So people who have a poor immune system. Those are opportunistic pathogens. Um, 
your defenses are weakened. So we have uh, medical conditions that can be caused by fungi that are not always just pathogenic. We have allergies. You can be allergic to mold, obviously, and you can have um, neurological conditions due to toxin production from mold, like black mold in your walls or whatever. All right, getting into the infections caused by fungi, we have like some, this, I'm gonna try to go to the ones that you know about, but Tinea versicolor is this first one that it's talking about. This is like, you get the patchy light and dark color on skin. Most of the time you can treat this with an antifungal and it will go away over time. Not always for some people, but that is, that can be caused by um, a fungus. Then we have, you know, fungus in the hair, or the scalp really is what I'm trying to talk about the, on the skin and all of that sort of thing. So that could be like ringworm. It can be athlete's foot. It could be, um, you know, uh, dandruff, or it could be, you know, fungus in your toenails and stuff like that. We have candidiasis, we have yeast infections. Um, we have more specific diseases like coccidioides, um, coccidio, these words, coccidioid, coccidioidomycosis. There it is. There's the word. It made it out. Histoplasmosis, cryptococcosis. Um, all of these are less common in people who are relatively healthy, but we see this as a huge problems in people who have HIV. Let me move on. All right. Um, as far as industrial impact, it can have a huge negative impact on um, crops as far as destroying fruit crops. Um, there's also ones that can attack the corn and then ones that can attack grain. There's one that grows on like a rye called ergot that can literally cause people hallucinations. But yeah, that's just fungi. I mean, what are you going to do, right? Um, so that's pretty devastating. You got you to gotta have some sort of defense up on your farms in order to um, preserve them and protect them from fungal uh, dis destruction, if, especially if you're doing fruit. Um, but we also use them for other things, right? We can use them for decomposing. Um, we can use them for antibiotics. Yeah, that's where penicillin came from. Uh, we have alcohol production, acids, vitamins, and then food, right? So what I mean by food, talking about, you know, wine, cheese, bread. Okay, so which of these would not be found in a fungal cell? Now, we're going to go through each of them. Do fungi have a cell wall? Yes, they do. It's made of chitin. Do they have a nucleus? Yes, they're eukaryotes. They have to. Uh, we're going to skip that one because that's the answer. But do they have ADS ribosomes? Yes, because they are eukaryotes. Do they have 70S ribosomes? Those are found in prokaryotes. That's not a trick question. I mean, it is, right? But yes, they do. So these are found in prokaryotes, which means where else are they found? They're found in the mitochondria of eukaryotes. I'm just put mito um, so that you guys are, are aware of that. Remember that we'll have both technically in eukaryotes because our mitochondria and in our chloroplasts, if we have them, will have um, 70S. So they do not have chloroplasts. I said it earlier, I meant it. The protists moving forward, these are all unicellular. Um, they can sometimes be colonial but they're all unicellular, technically not true tissues. We're not having multicellular tissues like a you know, liver and a pancreas and all that bone. Um, algae and protozoa have been traditionally combined into protista just as like, a because they're lazy, essentially. I'm not even kidding. So um, algae, we will talk a little bit on. So algae are photo photosynthetic. So they will have chloroplasts. That is correct. So algae will have chloroplasts. So where is it at? Chloroplasts. They're photosynthetic. We're talking seaweed and kelp. We all know that, right? We all know like, you know, red algae and stuff like that as well. So um, they have all the normal eukaryotic organelles. They have chloroplasts for photosynthesis for using sunlight to create their energy. And then um, that can have whatever, a lot of different kinds of pigments. And then that is what causes them to look these different colors. Okay. All right. Um, they live a lot, algae, we see them a lot in the water. Plankton, this is a term referring to uh, floating communities of microscopic organisms. They're not all the same thing, right? But algae can be part of it. 
So these are uh, plankton in general are an essential, they play an essential role in the aquatic food web, massive role in the aquatic food, food web actually. And they produce most of the earth's oxygen. So what produces most of the earth's oxygen? Obviously, you know, microbes, but specifically plankton. Okay. And algae is part of that. Uh, the primary medical threat from algae really is just through ingestion of toxins during a red tide. So we have a lot of red algae that just produce toxins and they will overgrow sometimes in certain conditions and produce a lot of the toxins that can be dangerous. Protozoa, moving on. The protozoa are about 65,000 of them. There's a lot of them. Um, most of them are harmless, okay? Some of them are parasitic and they're all single-celled. Um, uh, they're heterotrophic. So they eat a bunch of different stuff. Um, they have complex organic food needs. They are free living. They live kind of out on their own. They don't depend necessarily um, on their own, the ones that are free living. Right, so we're breaking these up into free living and parasitic. So free living, they live on their own in whatever their environment is. It's scavenge, you know, plant dead things or they'll graze on live uh, bacteria and algae. So those aren't in animals or anything like that. That's not parasitic, but they'll just be below their station or whatever. Um, parasitic species, these are the ones that require living on or in another organism in order to survive, right? So they have a host and they're causing that host harm. Um, they can actually actively feed on the tissue itself of the host. So do you remember about bacteria and how we have the um, vegetative version of the bacteria that becomes a sporangium and makes an endospore and pops that endospore out? right? And then that endospore waits. And then when favorable, it becomes a vegetative cell again. Same thing here. Okay. Protozoa though, that vegetative cell that's happy living modal doing this normal stuff. That's the trophozoite. Trofo means eating. So this is, that's one of the eating. It's happy. It's living. It's good. Trophozoite. Okay. Then we have the cyst then it, that's when it goes dormant and it rests and it waits for, you know, favorable conditions. Um, this is probably the most important thing with regards to when disease is spread, because a lot of times you'll be, you'll be exposed to the cyst. So you can, you can go between those two. Okay, life cycles vary from simple to complex. They might need several hosts and go through different like life you know, living in each this host to get this and then whatever before it can go on and infect the next one and whatever. So, um, and then some of them can alternate between trophozoa and cyst depending on their habitat. So there's that as well. So their life cycle is going to dictate what, however they're transmitted. So some of them need to be um, transmitted by mosquitoes, for example. So um, like in malaria, um, it's going to be transmitted like the, they actually grow the protozoans grow in the mosquito's gut as well as in our cells. So we're both being parasitized. Parasitized, there's the word. <laughs> Feel right, parasitized. Okay, that's what I mean by the life cycle will di dictate the mode of transmission. How do they reproduce? A lot of different ways. And I'm not gonna make you guys remember which one does what. I'm just letting you know that they can do simple. They can't, protozoans can be simple reproduce, reproduction. Uh, asexual methods, and then mitosis. That's a more, more common way. We can have multiple fission where it's kind of breaking off into different ones. And then we can have a sexual reproduction as well. So we have all of that. That's how they can reproduce. And I'm not gonna make you guys remember which one's which, honestly, too much. We're gonna break them into groups based on how they get around. Pseudopods literally, mean, that word literally means false feet, okay? pseudopods, false pseudo pods, like podiatrist, okay? False feet. So they are gonna move like kind of fake foot movements, almost like they're walking. That's what you and I might consider the an amoeba. You know how they like reach out and then kind of pull and whatever. They also use that to eat, okay? Then we have the ones that have flagella for motion, which we talked about the, the structure of flagella, right? With eukaryotes. So they'll whip that, those things around. They can have one or they can have several of them. And then we have the ones that move with cilia. And then we have the ones that don't move at all. Cilia are the little ones that do like the beating um, to move around. Okay. The ones that use flagella, 
These are the Mastigophora. These use flagella, okay? So here's the info. I'm not gonna ask you about it. Single nucleus, sexual reproduction. They do form cysts and they are free living. They are not parasitic. Okay, moving on. Then we have the pseudopodia. Guess what they move by? Amoeboid motion with pseudopods, right? These are mostly amoebas. They use pseudopods for locomotion. Um, I mean, that part you should probably should be familiar with that part because it is the name kind of how they're split up. But I don't need you to know about, you know, asexual reproduction and all of these. Ciliophora, that one's pretty dead giveaway, right? Um, as well. So the pseudopod, the other one, pseudopodia, pseudopods, right? They move that way. Ciliophora, cilia. So the mastigophora has to be the flagella, right? So you see that that's the one that this one that's off. Um, all right, we'll move to that next one next. Right, so back to ciliophora, they use cilia. So just to run through it real quick, they have cysts, they have, can have multiple nuclei in a cell, um, divide by tra transverse fission, I don't know what it means. And then they have mouth parts. This is pretty cool to think about. They are free living as that are not, the ones that are not, all of them are not. And that is the AP complexins. So we're breaking it down, the AP complexins, just think that they're complex. These are the ones that are, um, the harmful ones, okay? So uh, they don't really move around for the most part, okay? They have complex life cycles. These are the bad guys. Most of them are identified at the level of their genus just based on their appearance. We can tell by looking at the microscope what they are to their genus, right? Um, and then, you know, species is where we add on that second name, yeah? So E. coli is Escherichia coli. So Escherichia is the genus. Coli is the species. Um, right. So other things we use to identify them: shape, the size of the cell, the type, the number, the distribution. You know what organisms it'll reproduce in, um, organelles, whether it has cysts, the number of nuclei, all of that stuff is used to determine what they are in any of these groups. Okay. Um, you need complex media to cultivate them, and you often need mammalian tissues to cultivate the ones that are parasitic. Okay, protozoan pathogens. Uh, if we're going to study uh, protozoans and helminths, so these are the eukaryote, um, well, not just the, not the fungi really, but I guess uh, the protozoa and the helminths, that's fair, that's fair. The more, we consider these kind of exotic diseases a little bit, even though some of them aren't. Well, we can, these, these are eukaryotes that are parasitic, so it's parasitology, okay? A parasite, we often use this for protozoans and helminths on, the, on a microscopic level anyways. Um, obviously a parasite could be like a tick or something, those are kind of a macroscopic organism. So parasitosis is a symbiotic relationship where the host is harmed and the parasite benefits. Here's some examples. So, so here we go um, with some of them coming from different groups, right? So it's not 100% perfect that these ones never do this and these ones never do this, but entamoeba, histolytica, diarrhea, it's called amoebiasis. And, uh, these are amoeboid. I'm not gonna go through all these, but neglaria and acanthamoeba cause pretty serious, pretty serious um, meningoencephalitis. It can be very, like a 2% survival rate. Like it's very serious. And we'll talk about that in unit four. Moving on, I don't care about that one. Um, things like Giardia, Giardia lamblia, very common one that we're going to talk about throughout the course. Um, giardiasis, very severe water, like severe diarrhea, and it can persist for quite a while. Um, and people can be carriers of it as well. Uh, trichomonas, that's a sexually transmitted disease. Um, trypanosomes, things like uh, T. brucei and T. cruzi, these are like sleeping sickness and, and Chagas disease. If you donate blood, you've been tested for Chagas disease. Um, there have been cases in the United States with this. It's transmitted by the kissing bug. It looks like the wheel bug, but a little bit smaller and without the wheel on the back, but pretty much exactly the same as that. So just FYI, you can look it up and I, and I do recommend that you do, but we'll be talking about it in later sections. Um, and in the winter, it's probably not as common. Well, it might be because they might be moving in, but they do like to nest in warm, like homes and stuff. They bite you and they poop where they bite. And then that's how you get sick. And it's very common for babies to get bitten. So just be aware of that. 
they're relatively large bugs too. Like they're like this, this big, you know? So um, maybe look them up. I don't know. Um, I can't remember what they're kissing bugs. What are they called? I can't remember if I can think of it. I'll let you know. Anyways, um, leishmaniasis, skin disease transmitted by bat biting uh, sand flies. Um, then we have plasmodium, plasmodium vivax, falciparum, and malariae, malaria, right? It's transmitted by mosquitoes. Pla uh, toxoplasma, cats in their litter box, transmitted to pregnant women. It can cause pretty significant disease. It's really bound for people with uh, HIV, uh, AIDS, um, toxoplasmosis, um, and is a little bit vector borne between the different hosts. Cryptosporidium is in the water. Um, Cyclospora, man, there's also one, a lot of these can cause diarrhea and stuff. Um, yep. Yeah. So I guess we're moving on to the helmets. That's the worms. These are great. The worms, they're multicellular and they have organs and organ systems because gross. They have a reproductive tract. They have digestive, excretory, nervous, and muscular systems with thick cuticles for protection on the outside. That's a thick and hardened layer. They have mouth glands, like to break down host tissue, almost like saliva, like we do. The parasitic helmets, okay, we're gonna talk about the tapeworms, the flukes, and the roundworms. And this is a depiction on the right, uh, mostly of this is a tapeworm. And then down here, I believe this is a fluke. But anyways, um, a lot of these are big enough to see with the naked eye, but their little babies aren't. So their babies, their eggs aren't. So each of these, like you see these segments on these tapeworms, each of these contains like a bunch of eggs. Okay. Helminths, we're gonna break it down. Flatworms, that's platyhelminthes. I think plat sounds like flat. That's how I remember the flatworms are platyhelminthes. The tapeworms are the cestodes. The flukes are the trematodes. This is a stupid way of how I've been trying to remember this word. I'm trying to think of better, better things for you guys, but this is how I remember it. I used to run these um, blood collection machines to collect platelets when I worked at OBI, um, called a trema machine. It took like three hours to do it, but it was called a trema machine. And now that was just like for like a year of my life. So it feels like it was kind of just a fluke. So that's how I remember that trema toads are flukes. And then, uh, I don't know, I just, you have to try to remember that nematodes are roundworms and cestodes are tapeworms. Unless you think of something better to share, please do. Okay, they're different life cycles. They have a lot of different, a lot of life cycles. It is absurd. So we'll go over them, <laughs> not today, but in uh, I think unit four, we're gonna go over like the actual like worm life cycles and stuff like that. But it is nuts. It is totally insane how many different life cycles that they can have. And um, all these different hosts and like the larval host and the intermediate host and the definitive host and whatever, it is stupid. But it's, yeah. So helmets, man, I don't know what to tell you about them, but they are really complicated. Uh, I guess the bigger organisms, you can do that, right? So um, this is a little picture down here, this gross, I don't wanna think about this really too much, but like we are talking about pinworms. So little kids play together, they touch each other, they have nasty hands and they never wash their hands and they put their hands in their mouth and on their face and on cat poop and whatever else. And they're putting their hands in their mouth and on their face and all that, touching their food and all. It's not hard to get pinworms. It's pretty common in children, even in the United States. Um, your little little kid uh, played with Johnny out in the sandbox and whatever. And then um, a little while later, she's got an itchy, itchy butthole, okay? And um, you'll put a piece of tape on, on there, on the area, and wait overnight. And then when you take the tape off in the morning, there will be little worms there. And that's pinworms. And you take them to the doctor and they give them an uh, anti-helminthic drug to get rid of the worms. It's pretty common, really pretty, pretty easy to get rid of too, though. So that's just one little taste of what you're gonna get out of these guys. All right, uh, nematodes. Uh, the nematodes, um, those were the round, the round, no, yes, round worms. I remember that. <laughs> the nematodes, the sexes have different morphologies. The trematodes, the flukes, the sexes are uh, separate or hermaphroditic. It can be either way. So, and the cestodes, 
It's like the tapeworms, they are generally hermaphroditic. They can reproduce with themselves. How do we classify them and everything? It's pretty easy with these. So shape of them overall, the size of them overall, what hosts they can grow in, the development in organs, um, presence of hooks, suckers, other things like that, um, their larvae and their eggs and um, you know stuff like that. Um, other ways to identify, we can look at the microscopic versions of their, like sometimes their larvae are microscopic and their eggs can be microscopic. So we can look at the internal structures of those as well to visualize what kind of organism we think it is. Um, sometimes we can culture them, but we usually don't for medical purposes anyways, for research purposes, you might. Um, there are 50 species of helminths that parasitize humans. We usually see these in the tropical areas and they're still very prevalent. It's just because people don't care about the, those tropical countries. Don't act surprised. They don't wanna fund the research to help people that they don't, aren't gonna get money from. So just doesn't get helped very much. Um, yearly estimate worldwide number of cases is in the billions with these guys. And so a conservative estimate is about 50 million infections in the United States alone, that most of them are going unnoticed and undiagnosed. Um, what group of helmets are the roundworms? Let's see if we can do this. Okay. The flukes were the trematodes. The nematodes were the roundworms, right? Right. Yes. Because um, this was the tapeworms. Captain Nemo, 20,000 leagues under the sea. I'm trying to see if I can relate that to a round thing. I mean, submarines are round. I don't know. I'm trying. I'm reaching. All right, that's the end with the eukaryotes. Remember, all eukaryotes have a true nucleus, which means it is membrane bound, have to. Okay. We also have membrane bound organelles, that's the internal structures. And then we talked about mitosis. We talked about um, an important concept, which was and there's the endosymbiotic theory, so don't forget that. The eukaryotes include plants, we don't care about them. Animalia, we really only care about the helminths. Fungi, and then the protists, we talked about the pro, uh, protozoa as well, which those, you should remember that protozoa belongs to protista because pro, pro, right? Just try to remember that algae go with protista as well, because I will ask you stuff like that. All right, um, special lifestyles like cysts versus trophozoites, right? And then how do we characterize each of these, right? We talked about that as well. So that is it for the eukaryotes. Whew, that is a lot. Next, I'm gonna have the viruses. So I hope that you're ready for that. You do really need to kind of focus and go back and just make sure you understand a eukaryotic cell because we will be talking about eukaryotic cells in regards to all of these because our cells are eukaryotic. So, you know, we're going to need to know about eukaryotic cells for understanding uh, bacterial infections, viral infections, you know, fungal infections, um, and um, our immune system, and plus helminths and protozoa are going to be eukaryotes too. So you really need to have a pretty solid concept of the eukaryotic cell and its components, at least, um, at least the big picture ideas of them, okay? Like mitochondria energy, right? So... Get that under your belt and I will see you guys next time. And I can't wait.